back in Houston, Texas with Kurt Newbeck and uh, bringing an update on uh, several of his experiments and uh, test proofs of concept and anything he has to say about solar cooking that has transpired since about a year ago. It's about a year ago that I was here. Yeah, yeah. Well, really looking forward to this. So, so what's new since since a year ago? Yeah, well, there, I, I continued this uh, avocation in, in solar. Uh, you put on a video, but after we, right after we met was uh, at the annual Sandcastle competition in Galveston. We did a nice big demo there. The American Institute of Architects, AIA, sponsors that event, and they offered us a tent to do that. It was a great success. We're planning that again this summer. Yeah, because uh, yeah, that, I don't know, because of COVID, I don't know what the latest numbers were, but it was very, very well attended. But they get like 25,000 people walking yeah. the beach. So. Sure. It's an incredible place, and, and we had great, great response to it, too, which was, which was really fun. Uh, and, and it's so interesting. You see people, everybody, literally every person who came by, I would start telling them a story about, oh, this is this one, and then I would walk them through, and not a single one was bored with the story. They were all captivated. And I saw some people, they would just, like, stare, like, <laughs> like literally their mouth was open their jaw was dropped they're, they were just soaking all in it was brand new to them clearly but you could see the wheels turning yes uh and there was a guy from a restaurant who told the story that oh, oh this would be cool i could do like a solar night and and just invite people and say you know we have solar cook whatever whatever we happen to, if we were able to cook something solar that would be the the, the featured uh even if it's just appetizers or something yes. so that was a neat idea too and there was one guy, we had, uh, we had a wide variety of cookers out there, uh, including uh, some tube cookers. And one guy walking by said, oh, I love that one. That's my favorite. And so it's just... It, a little, a little uh, testing the waters. You're hearing a little bit of activity already out there. Right. Using solar cookers. Right. Yeah. Right. So that was all very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then more recently, I showed you some slides that I've been doing some, a series of, of really experiments or, or tests uh, and some of which I posted on Facebook, but I'll, I'll give you a brief summary of, of these. So I we have we we get some uh, meal kits in the mail once in a while, and so these boxes come that already have uh, not all of them, but I've been I've obviously seen them on solar right. So I see one that's like oh this so it's got this three quarter inch it's a regular cardboard box, but then inside of that the insulation they use is this three quarter. Uh, just corrugated cardboard with this uh, some kind of aluminum mylar or foil on here. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And even though it's a little, you can see, kind of bumpy, uh, still I said, oh, that would be interesting. So I started with these humble little boxes, and and I just made four of them the same. I just put a piece of glass on them. There, uh, there's some uh, weather stripping just to, to get a good seal on there. But then I just put them out, and, and I, I picked up there's a, a, multiple companies make these thermometers. They're really made for smokers and, and barbecue grills, but they're standard, so they, uh, you know, off the shelf, and they're really cool, because they have probes, a different kind of probes you can stick in the food, uh, but then also it beams to your phone, and it goes to the cloud, and so it captures all this data. Uh, just, again, off the shelf stuff, so that was, so first, these were all identical the first day. I was just trying to see, does this even work? And you see, they all hit about 150, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and this was from about 3 to 4 in the afternoon. Uh, but it's just facing them toward the sun. So that was good. Then the next day, I said, all right, now I'm going to put some pans. I had these black aluminum pans that I've been saving up also from the grocery store. I said, oh, I could probably use these for solar cooking. Uh, and I put some water in there and I put the probes in. And and so that, what that data showed was, well, first of all, I was in the backyard and you see where the shadow from the house hit the yellow box <laughs> and then it hit the red and the blue boxes. But the green was all over the place, so clearly that, that probe was in the air or something. Uh, but still, I thought, well, the rest of these are doing okay, but the box, i got to get this, this to be more predictable. Sure. So then I tracked down some little Dutch ovens, oh, uh, nice. and 
they're they're cute little, um, they're, but they're heavy. They're they're uh, Dutch ovens. Do they have the Pringles here? Uh, yeah, they've got they've got the mass. Yeah. For the cast iron. Yeah. Uh, and and what I did was I took the lid off or took the knob off the lid until I so put could put the probe down there and just put some little um, O rings so it would be suspended in the water and then. And I get pretty good results. I was again, you can tell we're, we're the shade from the house <laughs> across all of them. Um, and then this one, I did, I spilled it or something, or checked the probe for when it takes a dip. But still, you can see they all perform pretty close to, to being the same. So I said, all right, well, this is starting to be repeatable. So then I took them out to this out in the sun, <laughs> got a sunnier spot, and said, all right, let's now let's see what's happening. And so. Again, pretty good performance, but I didn't change anything. They were, the intent was just to see, are they going to perform about the same? One was a little lower than the others, which I don't know why, uh, but I tried. I would change the probes to see if it was the probe, and I calibrated those. And so uh, by putting them in all the boiling water, and they're within a d degree or two, so well, that's not the issue. But one of the things that was interesting here is I also got the uh, infrared sure. attachment for my phone, and and I was noticing, and you can take the temperature, so on the face of these boxes, the temperature was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the other faces, the outside of the box was 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I guess just because it's in the sun and probably some reflected off the ground, I wonder if that's contributing. So the, the next week, uh, I said, all right, there, there's an experiment waiting to happen. So here what I did was I did four boxes, the same four boxes, but Two of them I painted, actually my son Grant was on me, um, painted the front face of these two black, and then we wrapped the other side with Mylar, and these are wrapped on the outside, all four sides with Mylar. And then I put this ground, just a sheet of aluminum, on the ground in front of, so, so you can see we got, um, well, and then it shows so well in, the, in infrared that the one that's black with the ground reflector is the hottest, then the one that's black is the next hottest, the one that's wrapped in mylar but still has a ground reflector is still warmer than the one that has no ground reflector. Ooh. And and then we look at the so I had now I got by this time I said, oh, now I need more probes. So I got one one four probes just for the air temp, one four probes just for the water temp. Uh, but look at the 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 water temp, it's just crystal clear. Well, except again I I spilled the yellow one one foot because I turn them every half an hour. Sure. Um, so I spilled the water in one of them, so the yellow took some time to recover. But it, that's why, the, and, I, and when I took the picture, I wrote on there to make sure I got the color coding. But so you can see the black with the ground reflector is by far the best performer, and then black. This is just on the sun facing side, uh, and then even though it's wrapped with all shiny, if it had a ground reflector, that was next, an and then. Just no ground reflector and no black was the, was the worst performer. So that got up to, you see, about 178 degrees. So that's, you know, not for very long. It took a long time to get there. So we're still not very good performing uh, cookers, but, you know, it, we're starting to get into temperatures that would be worthwhile. So then the next time I said, all right, I'll take just the best performing one. And now we're going to start adding some variables. I double glaze both of them to get the temperature. But then I said, I'm going to vary the volume of the box. Because those were, as I said, standard boxes were about 12 inches deep. So then I cut one of them in half. Because I just, I just know, again, one of the factors is, given the same at collector area, there's going to be more volume to heat up and more losses through the skin by having, having twice as much skin surface. So I said, the, the smaller box should be better performer. And sure enough, well, significantly more. In this case, because I had two boxes, the water is the smooth line, and the variable one is the, the air temperature in the box. And you can tell when the, when the cloud came by. And sure. uh, and then these little bumps are kind of interesting. That happened every time when I would turn it back into the sun every half an hour. So you can see very predictably it goes back up, and then there's a, a little bit of shade gets in there, it goes down, and then when I turn it again. So that's what all those bumps are caught by there. That's just in a box, the temperature inside the box. But the water, you can see, is climbing very uh, Here, again, it looked flattened out because it was shady for a time. But look at the difference there, 199 for the box that was half the volume versus 184. So uh, so that's another thing just uh, that tells us generally you want the volume as small as you can given the, for, for a given aperture area. Sure. It will help reduce the losses. 
And then I did one where all the boxes, I kept, went to all the boxes six inches deep. This time I did all shiny because with, uh, back on where the face was all black, that, I know that was, a big part of that was because the boxes were so deep, it was making a difference. So, so this time, uh, instead of painting all the boxes black, I went back to sh wrapping them in shiny. But this time what I varied was, uh, oh, this is the black interior question, the classic black, black interior yes. question. So I did three tests, and this time, so this one was all the sides were, well, this one was all the sides were reflected, that's the yellow. Then black just on the bottom, uh, oh, just on the bottom was, um, was, was the blue, and then black on both sides. And what I did for that was I got some, they make this black foil. Oh, sure. Uh, that's used for, yeah, you know, for, recognize from theater and people yeah. use it for photographic lighting and things like that. So that's what, that's how I used the black to put a layer of foil inside there. And so this was, I didn't think it was as conclusive as I would like. Again, because in this case, the, black, the blue one, I knocked the water over, and I had, so the blue one was out <laughs> halfway through the race. <laughs> uh, but so this is box air temperature, and this is the water temperature. So what was very interesting here is the so the the black bottom, which is the blue one. Oh, sorry, I keep going on. So the black bottom and the all reflective were neck and neck out of the box, and the all black actually lagged for the first hour or hour and a half. But then you think, you see things started to happen a little bit here when that one dropped out. Um, you, you can also tell by the box temperature, it was cloudy for a brief time there when it, when it went back down. But then, and this was, I thought, the most interesting part. The air temperature, the all black outperformed the all reflective. That didn't surprise me. Right. Um, but, uh, but this was the thing that, whoops, that I think, oh, that works, <laughs> um, that I think is interesting for people, is that the all reflective, or the all black, the, the water temperature never got hotter than the air temperature. It makes sense. It's basically an oven. Yep. You're heating up the air, and whatever you put in there is, can't get any hotter than the air. So if you're going to bake... And this was what I had observed prior to this one. I was, so this part was confirmed. That if you're going to bake, then doing all black definitely works because you're going to get the air temperature as hot as possible. So if you're baking cookies or something, uh, then, then that works. But if you want to cook something in a pot to get hotter, then you want some of the reflection. You want more of that power going right to the pot because the yellow one that was all reflective, that temperature of water got hotter than the temperature of the air. So, so that was that was helpful. Um, let's see if I can get that this back to normal here. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll, I'm sure I'll do this test a few more times because it's sort of a classic question <laughs> that the industry doesn't have one answer for, and I didn't prove it one way or the other. Other other than two things I just mentioned, which I think those are I, I've seen that before, and the just supports that. Again, the idea of if you're baking and you want a hot air temperature, then all black inside. Um, but the all black, but the black just on the bottom might very well be the right combination. And because that one dropped out, that I could I can't make yeah. any conclusions. Yeah, it looked one. like it was it was starting to creep above. Yeah. Before that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and here the water temperature too, it, it had started to break out. So and there are, again, there are people who do that. Uh, like in India, they use the shallow box, black bottom with this absorber plate. Well, that's the other variable. The, all of these I had suspended, well, I say suspended, but they were up on glass to get up off the bottom slightly. Um, but it, like in India, their classic box cooker, they put, it's rather shallow box, and, but they put a, an absorber plate. They put steel or aluminum down first, black, yeah. and they put in the, the pots right on top of that. So I didn't, I didn't model that one. But where I'm going with this, some of the other things that I want to do with probably with these same boxes is, oh, so of varying the cookware yep. is, isn't so much a variable, but it's one of the things that I, I mean, in other words, uh, I will end up doing that because I, I love the Haynes pots. I think they're, they're very high performance and I think you're gonna, anyone would get really good performance using a Haynes pot. You know, it, it's, it's relatively thin steel, it's got that flat black, it's just, it, it's so good. 
Um, but then, but it was too big for my boxes, so I couldn't mm -hmm. use those. So that's when I, I got the small ones. Those were good, but they're cast iron. And they're only four inches. They're like single serving. I'm not sure that's the best representation. So then I picked up some uh, granite ware, the eight inch roaster, and those are nice right. because not only granite ware, of course, is people have been using that in solar cooking for a long time, but it also fit, not only fits inside here, but it fits inside of a Pyrex bowl. So if you're doing the clamshell Pyrex, then that's a really good one. So I'm, I, I, I just bought some of those, so I'll be using that probably going forward if it fits in the boxes. Mm -hmm. um, and then last time I was here, you remember we talked about, or you were here, we, we talked about uh, in solar cooking, you want to maximize the gains and minimize the losses and some of the ways to do that. So I'll be doing that. So one of the first things I'm eager to do is get it tilted toward the sun. And because and, and, all these were just like this, they were just uh, forward facing and I didn't vary the, even though the sun was going up and going down, I didn't vary this, I kept those the same all the time. So that's another thing one could do, but tilting it toward the sun will make a big difference. Uh, and then obviously varying the reflectors. If I add more, much more reflectors, then we're going to start getting some cook, cooking temperatures really good performing. And then varying the insulation. Uh, because once you get a point toward the sun, I'll do some two inches of insulation, four inches of insulation, and see what that, you know, what the effect is. Because I know it'll perform through better, but it'll be interesting to, to do enough of these. So probably graph, you know, where is the mean of the curve? Where is it? Sure. Uh, where is it? Um, you know, you start to lose the effectiveness. Uh, you know, eight inches is better than six, but is it worth the cost? Or, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. And then varying the glazing. That that I do have. I've been here. I've been using um, just uh, tempered glass. And I mentioned this last time. These were uh, these this tempered glass. Actually, this particular one is a low E, low iron glass. Um, but I also have some regular tempered. In fact, this piece is, is tempered. Um, and I, to do the double glazing, I just put some weather stripping in between there. So that's, that's really simple. But I was able to track down some vacuum glass, oh my. sheets of glass from China where that it's got a 0.3 vacuum in between these two shaped pieces of glass. So, uh, so I'm, I'm eager to try and see what the performance of that is. And the, the sale, the lady that I talked to in Shenzhen, well, where, I, where I ordered these from, she said, oh, you should get the, the, the low E. I said, no, 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 I don't want low E. She right. said, it's the best performer. I said, not for my application. So uh, I ended up with one, one with the low E and one without, one was just two, as clear as I could get low iron um, with vacuum. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of performance we get out of that. That's, I, I'm, I'm, but, but I don't want to do that prematurely. If I do that now, before I get all these other things optimized, I don't think you're going to see as much of an effect. So, sure. Sure. Uh, so that's where I'm heading with these, these experiments over the, over the months. I just do it on weekends when I have time. Uh, but it's a fun little hobby. And, and, it, and when I post it on Facebook, I always get interesting comments and good questions. And mo most recently, I've been posting like, all right, here's the setup. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> and yeah. I get some interest that way. Plus, that's what you know. That's the way uh, you know uh, the way adults learn. If you get them thinking about it first, what do I think is going to happen? Then it it just cements differently. Uh, so then, where am I going? And what my latest project of what do I think is not only where's that going, but if I were building, well, I am but, uh, working on what's what do I think is like the. I won't say the ultimate, but we talked last time about some of my goals were I want to, you know, if I want to cook pizza or something, I want it to feel conventional. So I said, I still want it to be real easy and obvious to use, like, like a toaster oven. You should be able to walk up, put the food in, push the button, and it should be that simple. Um, you had, you posted an interview just yesterday, and with uh, Tom Hoffman, yes. yes. And he was talking about, he wants to keep it in the kitchen. Now, I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking if you're going out, if you're going to be outside, you, maybe you're barbecue cooking, uh, or maybe you got the meat on the grill or something, but let's have a similar appliance next to it that's a solar cooker. So you can cook the beans or cook whatever you're going to cook, or cook the whole meal if you want to. But I'm picturing it as compatible with, with barbecue grills and something you would see at any retail store that sells those would like to have something that's a solar cooker. I think that 
That's, I, I like that vision, uh, whether I'm making it or not, I don't know, but I'm just kind of exploring what that might that look like. Um, so uh, again, set it and forget it, and, and ideally it's got a temperature gauge and a timer, and you should set this for 350 for 20 minutes, and you hit the button, and then you, and you walk away and until you hear it ding. That's the way all the cookers work. So uh, I like this to work that simply. So, so what does it take to do that? Well. I want to go back briefly. I showed this slide last time, and I don't think I explained well enough wh why I think this was significant or what was the, the background. And so let me tell you about something that you know about. So there's something called a reciprocal optical test. Uh, Dr. William Bradley did this, and he came up with it. So I think it's a really good, it's been around for a while, and it's on the, the SCI wiki, uh, and, and he's posted other papers, and there's a video where he explains and tells the story. But essentially what happens is, he said, rather than test, trying to test these things at any given cooker all year and try to understand the performance, I wonder what would happen if, if you could, by taking a picture of this, you can see how much of the pot, yes. and if you put the, think of putting the camera where the sun would be, then everywhere the camera sees the pot is the same place the sun rays are going to hit the pot. So, by, so then these studies look at if you vary the angle of the sun, or in this case the camera, how much of the reflectors are, in this case, turning orange. So, so he said, let's get a pot that basically glows so we can tell. And he gets down and measures the number of pixels that are, let's say, hot. And then and he's found a correlation between the, the surface area, uh, or the area of the orange in this case, to what the temperature is under actual, you know, temperature, uh, not just simulation, but so there's a good correlation between the actual performance. So, so that's effectively what I was doing here. I, I wasn't, I wasn't overtly trying to do reciprocal tests, but it basically it's the same concept. Where I was doing these 3D models, and then I used, I have to use a red ball just so you can see it, but in these, I took these same, uh, these three models that I had created in the computer, and I essentially looked straight down the barrel. So if you had a tracker, this is what the sun would see. And it's really the same reciprocal optical test. <laughs> it's the same idea. So, and you can really tell here too, this is the same cooker. This is a different, not any of those, this is a, a, a bigger one. But look at the difference between if you're looking straight down the barrel, how much red you see yes. versus angle when hardly any of it is red. So that's one of the reasons why aiming it right at the sun makes a big difference to the amount of performance. Uh, so, with that in mind, you're going to see this in, uh, a little bit later, in just a few slides. So, again, last time we talked about conduction, convection, radiation. These are still important, and been thinking more about this. And one of the things is, we, and we said last time, in northern Minnesota, north of you, in climate zone 7. So, again, as an architect, uh, when we're designing buildings, you have to go by the energy code as the minimum amount of insulation. And what happens is we all know heat rises, so you need more insulation in the ceiling than you need in the walls. And so in that climate zone, where the what they call the delta T, if you're inside the outside temperature of 90 degrees, you need R20 in the walls as a minimum and R60, so three times as much insulation in the ceiling because the heat rises. Meanwhile, uh, so so meanwhile, when you look at what do we do with a typical oven? Even a well-insulated oven, like Stan, uh, Stan Wells has said that he took his All American Sun oven apart and they had about one inch of insulation on the sides and a half an inch on the bottom. So he, on his, he put two inches of, of mineral wool on all sides. So even if we take that as a well-insulated box oven, you got maybe R7 on the sides, maybe four or five, mm -hmm. and the top, the glass is R1 or two. Oh, right, right. Meanwhile, the heat is still rising. And other studies have shown that 70% of the heat lost in an oven is through the glass. I mean, it makes sense. The heat is rising and we have almost no insulation there. And so you put two and two together, the obvious conclusion is we should be insulating the top. So now my big idea is what I'm calling the upside down box cooker. If we turn it upside down, then we're gonna be able to trap the heat, put three times as much insulation on the top, get some reflectors so we're shining the light up from the bottom, and we're gonna get much higher performance than, than everything else being identical if we just can turn it upside down and reflect the light from the bottom. 
So, and building on that idea, so what else would be the upside down cooker? So it would be just let's fit the rest of those goals that I was talking about. It would be a, a standard cooker, and in fact, I have actually bought now on on uh, Facebook Marketplace or uh, you know any of those resellers that I got the biggest um, toaster oven I could find. Uh, older, and they're they're always working. I'm trying to find working ones, but people I guess don't because <laughs> even working they go for twenty or thirty dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but then insulate the inside of it, cut out the bottom, and and start building from an actual toaster oven. Uh, so it has the look and feel of an appliance. It is an appliance. Um, and then, uh, but you get the reflectors in the bottom. And then I also want to shield the the reflectors from the cook. You shouldn't get blinded by right. all that stuff. That should be safe, not only safe to use, but it shouldn't be, you know, something that you worry about or you have to wear, you know, welding goggles or anything <laughs> like that, which <laughs> people do. So if we kind of look behind the curtain here, there would be a series because the sun's coming from here, um, pick and pick any angle, it's gonna look something like that. And you might say, well Lots of people have done that. I mean, you know, the yeah. primrose, you recognize that's, that's oh, essentially what they said. It doesn't have a box on top, but the reflector is the same way. And you've seen this one. Yes. I don't know how many other folks have seen this one. Um, on, on Facebook, there's a guy, his name is, is in Greek <laughs> in the name, but uh, Google Translate told me it's George <laughs> Angelitis. Um, and but he's built this and has posted a number of videos and photos and it's incredibly high performance. I don't think he has the same kind of box of an idea, but he, he uses it for a grill and it's clearly very high performance. Um, but again, the whole thing has to rotate and then tilting these things for different times of day. He's got a little lever there, so it's not as easy to use as I want it to be. But, but you know, again, proof of concept, it, yes. it works and people are doing it. And then even to a degree, the light fire, this is an actual oven. And for anyone who hasn't seen that, they, this is made in France. And um, well, I've seen it in France. I, yeah, light fire is based in France, but they also use it uh, in Scandinavia somewhere. Uh, they have a version of this where that's not just an oven, but that's a whole sauna. <laughs> uh, and you can take it out in the middle of nowhere and, and you get so much heat from these five square meters of, of mirrors. Uh, but they do community ovens and commercial bakeries with those things. So the idea of bringing the light in from below in an oven, again, it's proven. It's not, this is not science fiction. Um, so then the next thing is, well, it's going to need to rotate. Um, so again, some vocabulary here that you know. If you're, let's say you've, you've got something, you're facing the sun south. As you rotate this way, that's known as the azimuth. And then up and down is known as the uh, elevation or altitude sometimes. So you got if you've got a dual axis tracker, then you got to you got to have something that turns this way and something that turns this way. Now you don't actually have to do it that way. The other way is in like with telescopes when they use what they call an equatorial mount, is if you tilt the whole thing to the axis of because the sun is doing this in a straight plane. If you tilt the whole thing to the axis of the plane of the ecliptic, then you can just rotate. In, in one axis, okay? So either one of those works, um, but clearly I'm gonna have to rotate uh, if we, and what Stan Wells does, Stan uses the, the two, he's got the two axis. So he, and, and if, if, for anyone watching who doesn't know Stan, you know, look this up and he, he's just, he, he has perfected this idea of these trackers and he's built several of these and he keeps building them. I mean, now he, he's got a boat that tracks it. Now he's got this solar um, with a sundial, and he's got he's and it's just so well proven. He's got this down to sign. He keeps you know fiddling with it too. And then this one I love. I think this is probably the highest performer cooker ever built, which is a vacuated tube with a big reflector on a tracker. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how you're gonna get any higher performance than that. Uh, and it, it may be that the reflectors could be a little bit longer, like the, the Ghost Sun Sizzle uh, has been tested, but it wasn't on a tracker. But uh, I think if you've got the reflectors as long as they have in the sizzle and put this on a tracker, that's going to perform better than anything. Um, and then, the, oh, and one of them was tying, you know, last time I was here, we, I had those little models. Yes. Um, Stan picked up on that. 
and built this little tiny little tractor, which he called the Nubec 2.0. He didn't even <laughs> yes. put it on there, <laughs> which was so kind of him. Uh, so that's so that I'm thinking basically I'll end up with sort of a, 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 at least for the azimuth, at least for that rotation, uh, using a, a same kind of tractor that Stan uses. But then it's going to have to do this other kind of tilt. Now, ideally, what I'm hoping, when you start studying the angles, it's not simple. Uh, we'll get it in a second. What I'm hoping is maybe I can make this thing just rock and pivot about the center of gravity, because then it'll be easy to do. Sure. Uh, the angles won't be perfect, but I'm hoping they'll be close enough. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I've been studying. Uh, so there's the Scheffler reflector basically does that. Uh, there's, and you can use the Scheffler reflector either in the vertical or just like we're talking about in this horizontal configuration. But what Scheffler does is just like I was talking about with that equatorial mount. It's, it's aimed, you got it, and, and look, and it's pretty complicated. There's, there's a lot going on there, and what the, the way the Scheffler works is because of, essentially you put it in the equatorial, but because of the, because the, depending on the time of year, sometimes the plane ecliptic is down here and sometimes it's up here. <laughs> And, you know, in the summer it's higher, and then at, at equinoxes it's in the middle, and in the winter it's lower. Um, the what the Scheffler does is they actually he came up with it's clever. Rather, if you figure out the angles, it's it's different all the time. So he came up with this idea where you can take this partial paraboloid, this reflector, and then actually bend it or vary the shape of the dish. So that's how that's what makes the Scheffler reflector work really well. And there are apparently thousands of these in India, and they use them all over. And 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 you can put it in the plane ecliptic, and it tracks the daytime either by itself or very easily. It could be on a uh, clockworks or or a tracker. But uh, but then for the seasonal adjustment, you have to go in every week or so and turn the dial and turn the knobs, and and that's what again it works. The science is proven. But for my, I, I don't, I just want it simpler than that. I don't want somebody to have to fiddle with it every time. So what I'm hoping is, so then what I do is I study, so these are all, these are right now 2D studies that I did in the computer where I, I essentially started with, I know these are tiny, but started with, if I took that box and looked at, well, this is basically the diagram we were just looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, took the box and said, if I start with a given angle, uh, started with some, because no matter where you are in the world, whether it's uh, it, sometimes the sun is low, sometimes the sun is high, how high it varies. And I have some studies on that too, but um, that, that's all well known. So if you start with the box and look at what are the ideal reflections for different angles, then you get slightly different curves. As Just like Scheffler, you ch ch change the shape of the curve. So what I did was I, I played with this enough and tried different studies to say, all right, can I get them close enough that I can pivot? So then I started, so then I basically picked one of these curves and said, if I start at 25 degree angle, um, and you can see all those reflections go up into the box. And then if I rotate this thing and put 36, uh, and also I get about four feet walk, uh, of, uh, of reflections going into that box. And then as, the, as I tilt it more, it's not perfect. I'm starting to lose some, and, and at noon here at 84 degrees, some of it's actually yeah. missing the glass. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I have a couple of options. Either I figure out, either I decide or test that, of course, at noon you're going to have it's you get the most power anyway. So that's why I think having the fact that I'm getting less reflection area is probably a good design consideration. In other words, I would another way to think of it is. When the sun is low and you're only getting maybe 300 watts per square meter instead of a thousand, well, you need more reflector area if you want to keep the same temperature. So, so given all of that, so I'm trying to get it to where I can keep it simple. And then you get to this, and this is the final slide. So this is a 3D view of it. So I want it to be able to spin about that axis and then hopefully pivot this way. I've also thought, well, there could be some other mechanism where when it tilts that there's some uh, either some chains or some offset uh, some eccentric gears or something where it lifts up the bottom end goes a little higher uh, and then it goes lower as it rotates so 
I don't know, there's, uh, but I'm trying to keep it simple. But then this final image is that very same reflector, uh, just from the sun's view, from a 25 degree angle, what, what would the sun see? And again, I've got a red ball inside that box. And in fact, uh, this middle band came from the study, the slide you just saw. So I knew that was gonna work. But then the, these sides, I just built literally in this 3D model, I would just say, I would guess, and then, and then, and then render it and say, all right, <laughs> am I seeing enough? And then I would raise this up or lower it until I got, I could see the whole ball in each one of those panels. Now, obviously the angle that you're seeing through the glass changes each time. And at some point, as we talked about last time, at some point, the angle gets too low that most of it's gonna bounce off the glass. I was also checking for it. I don't wanna go that far out. Um, but you could, as you can see, you could also make this wider, like, like in George's, well, his was about this wide. Uh, you could potentially add some more reflectors on the side here if you really wanted to increase performance. But the other thing I'm thinking about, if you have this on your back porch or something, uh, uh, or on the deck, that this thing's gotta be able to pivot. Um, and depending on where you are and what time of day you wanna cook, you might have to pivot. I'm assuming you're gonna aim it south. Uh, and then it's going to pivot. You know, if you cook from ten till two or three, it's still going to have a got to have a pretty big swing. It's going to take a lot of real estate. So that's why I want to keep them as compact as I can uh, to get that to work. But, so that's it. That's well, the latest yeah. thinking. <laughs> well, and the, the primrose, I do have that. In fact, that photo model. That's pretty much it. Oh, like, uh -huh. there's like two or three ones. One where there's they're like uh, that's probably eighteen inches wide and. Uh, Bars of, of mirrors here. They're mm -hmm. flat, 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 but uh -huh. at the angle overall. And the one I have, it's a continuous uh, curve, and mm -hmm. it's uh, I'm sure it's polycarbonate with uh, aluminized uh, reflection, uh -huh. reflective material underneath it. And uh, the, the interesting thing you know about the angle of the glass, you put the pot in the hole, and then that is all lined with reflection, reflective material. I think it's aluminum foil, and then the angle of the glass is about like that. Mm -hmm. So they've obviously taken. That can get the where that seems to be most uh, appropriate is actually the, the northern climates. Or no, it's actually the, the, the equatorial area mm -hmm. because the, the it's going to be almost flat for most of the time that you're cooking, based on the height of the cooker. Theoretically, mm -hmm. you could add about a foot to the legs, and then it could it could be a little oh, more extreme. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know? But uh, um, and I haven't had the best re uh, luck with that one, but I don't use it as much either. I got to really set it out there. Until I met you and we went through this, I hadn't even thought of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, uh, it just didn't, I mean, it makes sense when you think about it because you see reflections in windows all the time. And then at a certain angle, it's not quite as much or, or, or it's more. Right. So, yeah. Wow. Well, I, I love the idea of having the, uh, and what's the software that does that? It's some kind of CAD software? To yeah, scale? yeah, this is, this is just AutoCAD, nothing. Okay. Uh, nothing tricky or elaborate. Uh, uh, some of the other things I've been doing, but um, not far enough to, to be able to show you anything today. There is uh, a number of, of software out there for doing energy modeling. Uh, many of them are, are uh, public domain because they're government funded. And some of them have plugins to, if you do a 3D model like this in, in SketchUp, which also there's a free version. So you can get essentially models and but in SketchUp, and then you import it into this uh, energy analysis software. And if you set if you set it up right, and you know that's the tricky part. <laughs> Any kind of simulation, especially. Well, anyway, um, you should be able to t tell you the temperature inside a room, and it's meant for a building. Uh, but I checked, and because yeah, I, I just emailing people and and turning on some of those. Uh, energy analysis boards uh, that, because not all of them will tell you the temperature of, of, a, of a space or volume if it doesn't have air conditioning associated with right. it, or heating or cooling, but some of them will, and some of them will also take from, into account the exterior reflections, which you have to model. Most people don't care about this if it's a building. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But on well, that uh, same software, you can say, well, this is a building, it just has to be Two feet by two feet by two That's feet. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, and it should work. I mean, it's still thermal dynamics, and it knows how, how high that is, so it should be able to factor that in. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I may end up going that route, too, just more for the, uh, I don't know, just for either the fun of it or just for the educational aspect of it. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, and, and you're able to actually change each individual mirror in that yeah. set. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and you're right, just like the, the previous, uh, like the, um, the optical, uh, reciprocal mm -hmm. optical study, that it actually is, is better if, if, if these weren't individual panels, if they were all one smooth sure. curve, sure. then everything would be red. Mm -hmm. And which is, so that's even better. It's just that you can simulate it closely enough with some individual panels, yeah. but uh, if they could be modeled as smoother then it would be slightly higher performance because that, then these areas in between here, essentially, well, depending on how it's curved, but basically the middle of, of what's all of these, it would all look like that. So, um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why the, the smaller the facets, uh, usually the higher performance you get. Well, the primrose, it's, it's, a, it's a flat, it's basically a trot because it's, it's flat this way and then it's curved this way. Right. And the ultimate would probably be to slightly cup it. And I, I'm thinking the, the picture of a shoehorn actually comes to mind, where yep. it's just a slight curve yep. around and probably it probably narrows as it gets to the top or wide. Uh, no, you're exactly right. Yeah. In fact, yeah. e even this little angle in the back here, I originally had these all parallel, but once I modeled it and I played with it, there wasn't any way to get that, that corner in red. So yeah. you're right, it just narrowed naturally. <laughs> yes. yeah. Because and it, it, it has to do with just what you said, and it, uh, a shoehorn is a, a good analogy because it does get tighter as you get closer. You can yeah. even see that here, uh, and it f gets flatter as you get further away. So yeah, so that the idea of actually get taking a uh, a, a toaster oven and <laughs> pulling the guts out of it and getting this stuff to work is. Be interesting the, the tracking part because the scans are already paved that way. I know I can get to get those two trackers to work. Mm -hmm. I, I have no hesitation about it. I mean, I haven't figured out exactly where I'm going to put the um, and and, and there, it, this is different than because Stans isn't dealing with a reflection, he's dealing with pointing the his aperture right. at the sun. Uh, right. Their so, are already kind of a standard, yeah, mount right. Angle. But he's basically pointing to, yeah. Where, whereas here, uh, I have to figure that out. But I don't, I don't think it'll be hard. Uh, it probably means that either the reflector, either the. Well, I don't know. I thought of a, a couple ways to do it. But yeah. <laughs> well, and, uh, the Scheffler, I had no, I didn't know this until you mentioned it just now. That the, that it can actually change the curvature of the, the poles. Yeah. So it can be a deeper parabola or shallower. And uh, I thought occasionally about. Setting up basically slats of aluminum so that it would be kind of like an iris, and you'd be able to do that, mm -hmm. like, where it would get wider, maybe shallower. But uh, I had no idea that you could, but that makes total sense. Well, the other thing, that, which I, I didn't make a slide of, but uh, you know how uh, uh, for temperature control, one of the things that Stan does is he puts a temperature controller in there and once it reaches a temperature he actually turns his 90 degrees out of the sun away from the sun and then once it pulls off so but that means so I'd like to that that work it's effective and then you had another video of I can't remember the gentleman's name but it was it was uh, the great big steel cooker that's so effective um, and he mentioned that if he just points it down to where he's got four inches of shadow in the back yeah. it, it'll yes. uh, 50 degrees off. Yep, Les McEvers. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. that was a great interview, and that, that his own rule of thumb of a four inch shadow is is 50 degrees. Like, oh, that's interesting. Yes. You could probably figure out, um, like, what does that mean? How much tilt is that certain number of degrees yep. of tilt? And just do that with the tilt yes. on, uh, on stands, for example, yep. or in this case, um, something similar, just aim it off a little bit or tilt it slightly yeah. to, to, to cool it down. And then the other thing that I thought of is even on a regular, even if you weren't doing ref bottom reflectors, or if you had a regular box with reflectors here, uh, I've also uh, thought about, um, I think it would be cool, to have these reflectors like slats. I found this on the web. To <laughs> my, 
my watch or something, <laughs> had the reflectors on slots so that you could turn them into the sun, yep. or perpendicular to the sun, so you basically reduced the amount of reflector area. There you go. And yes. it would just be one motor. I assume you could tie these, tie the four or eight of these things together, and and that that's there's something there. That's got legs. That will, mm -hmm. I can see that working. Because I think last time we talked, I was I was kind of noodling with that, but I was thinking like picture on the top, and I knew that was. But then the idea of oh no, make those the actual reflectors. That I'll, I'll end up doing that somewhere. Because <laughs> sure. that that definitely will work. And then trying to figure out, do you do two like two different banks of reflectors where, you know, if, if it's you, once it hits the temperature, do you turn them both away, or do you just turn the outer ones away, and then sure. if those are five degrees over, then you turn the other ones. You know, there's there's little interface things to be studied, but um, but that's that's where this is going, and and it, so I'm I'm still having fun with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What I'm thinking with Wes, if you can see. Four inches, two degrees, because he's usually just oh, knock it down two degrees. He found that four inch mark, but you could probably do graduated markings, right. you know, ten degrees, twenty, you know, um, and then he's out in the middle of the desert where it's it's pretty much constant. The atmosphere is away from any major metro centers. There's mm -hmm. no no real pollution to speak of, and uh, so he can kind of count on that. I imagine there there's got to be ways like with even with stands to say well rather than ninety degrees, maybe just. 45 or whatever, yeah, and uh, and he, uh, he's up in the mountains where it's pretty, you know, pretty clear air, so uh, being able to test it there and, um, yeah, yeah. Wow, well, I can't think of any other questions. There's uh, plenty of new new information, <laughs> uh, new insights, and the uh, new facts that I hadn't, hadn't heard of before. Mm -hmm. It always happens. It's, <laughs> that's great, that's how I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah. Well, and thank he, you so much, oh, it's yeah. always a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for the hosting me, the accommodations. It's been good weather, really hot, really hot, 100 degrees, but uh, beautiful. Yeah, I had yeah. considered setting up those boxes this morning and doing, getting one more experiment going, yeah. but as you said, uh, yeah, yeah. I probably would. Yeah. I may end up still doing that, <laughs> some of those this summer, but uh, you might have noticed that most of those other ones were the first half of this year. <laughs> yes, yes. January through March. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, good that you can pick and choose. You get, you get more sun than we do up there for this sort of thing. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you.